Hey Grove Women, and welcome to week three of our Galatian study. We're so glad you're here. Um, I did want to let you know now that we are in the Burr months, uh, our holiday marketplace and night at the marketplace are coming up November 1st and 2nd, and we need volunteers. If you're interested in helping and serving with us, we would love for you to join us and help. Uh, you can email me at cbrown at thegrove.cc and I can get you connected uh, to help us serve in that way. And then also the event is coming up, so we would love to have you join us for the event as well. So. Uh, mark your calendars for that and please email me if you're interested and uh, I hope you guys enjoy your study as we dive into Galatians 1 11 through 24. Okay, let's begin the exam. You'll have to let me know if you can see these words clearly. How does this look for you? Blurry and out of focus. Hmm. How about this one? Still out of focus. Well, perhaps this is what you need. Greetings, sisters in the Lord. Um, ex I'm so excited to be joining you today. I bet you never thought we'd be here again, right? Um, I know we didn't think we were going to be here filming again. Um, so many mixed emotions, but more than anything, we just wanted to create another space for you to be able to study um, and be able to have a space to invite others into that. Um, we are reaching capacity um, on Wednesday night especially, and it literally is, it's an exciting thing, it's a good problem to have, but now we gotta look at it differently. So how we, can we meet the needs of other people that wanna join us? And so we're so excited that we can create this option for you. Um, my name is Alicia Horton. I do get to serve as one of the Bible teachers here, and it is such a privilege to be able to teach uh, on this passage today. Um, so to be respectful and very mindful and responsible with our time, we're literally just going to dive right in. Um, today we're going to be talking about Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 24. Um, and to recap really quick, uh, based off of what Natalie uh, taught on last week, she did an amazing job of just helping us to understand the risks that are involved um, with God's name on the line, uh, His church, the souls of people, and that we don't have any time to deviate from anything other than giving people the gospel. Um, Paul was very clear about that. He also understood the risks that were involved, which is why it was so passionately declared from his words and his lips as to why there's nothing should be added or taken away from the gospel message. Um, and he was making an appeal in all of his uh, first letter. So we're going to turn our attention back to Paul. Um, and before we do that, um, let's uh, pray. Lord, we ask that you would... Um, just bless our time together, allow um, your word to be clear to our hearts and our minds and allow us to understand the truth that you want us to understand so that we can walk in obedience and apply the, the truth of your gospel to our lives and everything that we say and in everything that we do. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Um, Nicholas Copernicus uh, was a Polish scientist living about a century before Galileo had already come on the scene. And he had an unorthodox idea that the sun was at the center of the solar system. And Galileo had studied that, knew also about that view, and had accepted what Copernicus had also thought about the sun being at the center of the solar system. And it was Galileo's observations of Venus that actually proved that theory. Using his telescope, he found that Venus went through phases just like our moon. But the nature of these phases can only be explained by Venus going around the sun and actually not around the earth. And Galileo concluded that Venus must have traveled around the sun, passing at times behind and beyond rather than revolving directly around the earth. And Galileo's observations of the phases of Venus virtually proved that the Earth was not at the center of the universe. And his conclusion angered the Catholic Church leaders of that day because they felt that it went against their interpretation of Scripture and their understanding of what to be true. And therefore, they put him on trial, claimed he was a heretic, and put him on a lengthy housed arrest. And centuries later, with more scientific advancement, it was confirmed and established that both Copernicus and Galileo were actually right. So here are a few takeaways to take from this story. Number one, humans are prone to get it wrong. We get it wrong, but God never gets it wrong, especially when it comes to his creation. Number two, they were both telling the truth. Um, number three, 
in them telling the truth, they were standing for something that was unpopular and uncomfortable, especially when it went against the belief of others. And then lastly, isn't it just like our human tendencies to center ourselves at the universe versus reminding ourselves that this real son, Jesus Christ, he's at the center of all, center of it all, and he holds all things together. So here in these verses in 11 through 24, we're going to read about how Paul was telling the truth. He did not get this truth about the gospel from any humans, and he was going against those who believed different. And the big difference in what Paul believed and what he was passionate about defending is that his own life was a visible testimony of that truth. And so the main point that we're going to flesh out together today is this. Paul received the gospel as a direct revelation from God. He received God's call upon his life and was radically transformed for his glory. And so here we have Paul defending how he received the gospel. And why is that so important right now? And why is he getting in the weeds on this thought? Well, let's look at verses 11 and 12. He says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, my first defense here, I didn't receive it from anybody that was human. I actually received it as a divine revelation from God himself. And so I like to clarify words and give definitions to help our understanding. So definition of revelation is this, basically the act of revealing or disclosing knowledge or truth. And in theological terms, it is the act of God revealing or disclosing truth of himself to his creation. And so we know that the gospel was not given by any humans. Paul is declaring that, defending that. And now he's also saying my life is an example as to why it is true that I got it from God and not humans. And I just kind of want to pause right here to help us to think through why man's idea of salvation and righteousness apart from God looks like and why that is counter the gospel. So when we look at human history, we see the different religions, philosophies, idea, ideolo- the you know what I'm saying, the ideologies of today and even back then of how they thought that how we could obtain good standing, a good life, righteous living. So I want to park on this and talk about that for a little bit. We look at Hinduism. Their idea is this pursuit of pleasure, their pursuit of material success. This would then help you to lead a good and just life. And then you can reach enlightenment, which frees a person from suffering. This is what they believe. And then we also look at Islam. Their ultimate goal is to seek the pleasure of Allah, which is a false deity, a false God. And then hopefully that in you seeking this pleasure, working for this pleasure, you may have afterlife and it'll be in paradise and other things that could be promised to you. In addition to that, we look at Buddhism, maintaining a right view, right resolve, right speech, right conduct, do all these right things to rid yourself of any greed, hatred, or ignorance within yourself. You do all this and then you'll have this result to be free from these things and then you can reach nirvana, which is basically the end of the cycle of death and then you would be reborn, all based on what you do. And then we look at Catholicism. Believe that there is grace, right, through faith plus keeping the sacraments. Doing all these things as a way to maintain grace, to be in good standings with God. And then we look at Judaism, which is exactly who Paul is talking about here. He was a former Judaizer. He believes there is one God. Oh, they believe that there is one God, but they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah that offered salvation. And they believed so highly on the Holy Scriptures, the the traditions, the, the holy observances. And they thought that by their own righteousness, they could maintain a good life with God. That is man's gospel. And then we look here at God's gospel. We know that we are justified, declared not guilty, not by our own doing, not by our own works, not by our church attendance, not by regularly tithing, not by regularly serving in children's ministry, even though we love that you do that, not by starting a change group and maintaining that week by week. It is not anything that we could do. It is grace through faith alone, period. G R A C E, God's riches at Christ's expense. 
God did the work. It's through his righteousness, through his son, Jesus Christ, at the expense of his son. That's what we get to receive. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned, and all fall short of the glory of God, and are justified, check this out, by his grace as a gift. Notice it didn't say by our own doing, by our works. He's saying we are justified by grace as a gift. Through who? The redemption that is in Christ Jesus, not through us. And then also verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Romans 5, 1, 2 tells us, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access, here's this word, this connection to faith and to this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Point number one is this. The gospel does not come from humans. It comes from God. In our own terms, in our own ways of thinking, we would always get it wrong because it's not, it's not right. God established a standard. He established what his desire was for human uh, flourishing and creation. And when sin entered the world, we messed it up and therefore we need a savior. Here's some uh, thoughts about man's gospel versus, versus God's gospel. Man's gospel focuses on credit going to self. It's me. I did this, I worked for this, I obtained this versus the credit actually going to God and his gospel because we know it's his saving power why of, of how we are still here today, of what he done in our life. Then also we look at man's gospel, work, 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 work to maintain righteousness, to obtain this life of being good and just. And God's gospel says, it's not your work, it's Jesus, it's Christ's righteousness that he actually gave us because we can never work to be good and righteous before God. And then man's gospel cheapens grace. We, we use it flippantly. We don't value it for the way it is and, and receive it and live by it. And we look at God's gospel and we know that it's amazing grace that saved us. And we get to look at it differently with a different lens. And we know that it's only through the life of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins that satisfied that debt that we could never pay. So imagine we had a credit card that was a $100,000 limit and we maxed that thing by doing just living foolishly. And we could never repay it even if, even if we made minimum payments for here for the rest of our lifetime. It would not even put a dent because of all the interest that we would just keep accumulating every year. And God's like, I got you. You cannot pay that, nor you will be ever able to pay that. So he came, brought his credit card, cleared our debt through his love for us, forgave us of that, and gave us a new credit established through his son, Jesus Christ, his righteousness. God did the work. It was his righteousness that made us holy and acceptable before God. And we get to accept it by grace, through faith alone, period. Nothing added or taken away. And this is so backwards. This is so countercultural. This is so counterintuitive to the human heart and our minds to pursue happiness and achieve goodness based on our own work and merit. We want to be able to say, I did this, right? But salvation by works also appeals to man's pride and our desire to be in control. And being saved by works also appeals to, to the desire far more than the idea of being saved by faith alone. Because we're like, that's it? That's all I have to do? What else, do I, what else do I need to do? Nothing except by faith through grace alone. Or by grace through faith alone. You know what I mean. So then Paul looks at his former life. He looks at his, his former ways of living. So let's look at verses 13 and 14. He says, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. He's saying, okay, my first defense, divine revelation. My second defense, my own life. Look at me. He's like, yo, don't you remember? I used to be Saul. I was a former Judaizer. I persecuted everybody that believed in the way. I tried to violently destroy the church and I held so strongly to these traditions that I thought I was right and everybody else was wrong. And now here he's saying, let's look at verse 15. He says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born 
and who had called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. He's saying, I encountered the Messiah. I encountered the way and it changed me. He had a but God moment. And I just want to pause real quick because I know all of us have a but God moment. We were going down this road of destruction. We were going down this road of despair and God inserted himself, saved us, gave us a new life, new purpose and set us on a different path. And we all can reflect on that. But God, we know we would not be where we are today if it wasn't for God and his grace. And so Paul is saying here, I was set apart before I was born. He called me by his grace. He's referring to his Damascus Road experience. And we see this narrative in Acts 22, as well as Acts 9. I'm going to briefly summarize it because it's a lot to say and it's a mouthful. So I'll try to paraphrase. He's basically saying, I came and drew near to Damascus about noon. He was on this mission to go and capture more Christians and persecute them and put them in prison. He said, then all of a sudden, I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth whom you are persecuting. And again, he was blinded, he could not see, and he's like, okay, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said, rise, go to, into Damascus, and there you will be told all that I've appointed you to do. And then we follow up in Acts 9.15 when Ananias got a, a, a direct message from the Lord saying, hey, I need you to go and talk to this guy, Paul. And Ananias knew exactly who Saul was before he was Paul and was like, um, are you sure about that, Lord? Because like he has a reputation and I need to go talk to him for what? Right. And so here he then met up with uh, Saul. And so it says in verse uh, 15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed, entered the house, laid his hands on him. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on that road which you came has sent me to say that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul received his call and was considered equal with the other apostles. Question, how was Paul considered an apostle when he actually didn't meet the criteria of the other apostles? I'm glad you asked. Let's dive into that. So what is an apostle? The word apostle means one who is sent out. In the New Testament, there are two primary usages of the word apostle. The first is in specifically referring to the 12 apostles, and the second is generically referring to those individuals who are sent out to be messengers slash ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We see that used for missionaries today, and we also see that for evangelists. But here are some criteria and uniqueness of the 12 that set them apart from everybody else. Number one, they had to have been a witness of the resurrected Christ. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Number two, to have been explicitly chosen by the Holy Spirit. We see this in Acts chapter 9. Number three, to have the ability to perform signs and wonders. We see this in Acts 2 and then also in 2 Corinthians 2, 12. And then lastly, they were the ones that laid the foundation of the church. So that was also another uniqueness to their role. Paul was not a former disciple of Christ during his earthly ministry on, on, on earth, but Paul was directly met by Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was given the gospel directly from God. He was able to perform miracles. And he was also, his call was confirmed by the other apostles after he went to Arabia for three years, before he went up to see Peter and James. And, and again, he also says in these latter verses that he was unknown to the Judeans um, in their churches there too. So here we see that it was confirmed in Acts chapter nine He's debating other people and proclaiming deep truths that Jesus is the only way. So what happened? God met him, radically changed him, confirmed his call, gave him, set him apart, and gave him a new mission to now preach the good news to those that he once persecuted, including the Gentiles. And although I still believe that generically speaking, people can be apostles in the sense that they can be sent by God, like our missionaries and evangelists are sent out, I do not believe, however, that people have the office of an apostle like we saw back in the days of the New Testament. There are certain criteria to be followed and understood, and it is dangerous for anyone to claim this role because there's no biblical evidence to support that for today. So I want to show you a quick timeline of Acts and Galatians. 
um, if that's already been there, forgive me, but here it is now. <laughs> but basically, yes, so we see Paul the persecutor. We see this uh, description in Acts 7, 8, and 9 that's also um, in conjunction with what we see here in Galatians 1. Here he had the conversion at Damascus. And then we see three years before we, he actually ever went up to visit Jerusalem. So here he is going deep in his understanding of who God is and being able to defend it as we see in the narrative and descriptions of Acts 9. And so he's, he's, he's making a point here. He's like, I didn't go there first. I got my gospel and then I went back and start preaching it. He got it directly from God and he was able to clarify that with such precision and conviction. And so he's not saying, hey, let me discredit the other people because their message isn't true, like Peter and James and all the other apostles. He's not saying that. He's just clarifying, like, I did not get it from them because some Judaizers were telling him that he was perverting the truth, that he was teaching a different gospel when in actuality, they were the ones that were doing that. And so another time um, timeline, not a timeline, but a box to look at is this. Here the Judaizers were, Judaizers were saying that he was perverting the truth, they said he was a traitor to the Jewish faith, and yet Paul received his message from Christ himself. And again, he was one of the most dedicated Jews of his time, most zealous on his way to persecute and kill other Christians, and God met him, and he received his call. Paul received the good news, and he was changed. So point number two is this. Paul was called by God, and so are we. 1 Timothy 1.8 tells us, and this actually is the first letter written to his son in the faith. He says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So I want to ask you a question. Have you truly discerned what God has called you to do in the season of life that you are in? Do you feel like it's aimless or do you know exactly where God wants you to be? In his commentary, I like what Scott McKnight says. He gives us some helpful ways to discern God's call in our lives, depending on what season we're in. And it's not a one size fits all approach either. He's just given us some healthy guidelines for us to discern what, God is, what God's calling us to do because we also have a call. He said there's two categories, specific or non-specific. We see Paul and Peter had a specific call. One was to the Jews, the other was to the Gentiles. And then there's non-specific. Let's take it even for today's sake. Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom and you're in a season of life and God is wanting you to be in that season of life to pour into your children, to raise them up, to be ones that understand who God is. And that's the season, right? Then also, maybe you're called to be in a large corporation, to be able to live out your biblical convictions in the workplace for others to see. That could be a general call for many of us. And he says, not only that, we should follow some uh, healthy steps for us to understand, like by having an inner conviction. Okay, is the pursuit that we're seeking from God or is it from us? Are we wrestling over these things or we're we just trying to fit something in that we want, but it's really not what God wants? But also following up with having collective wisdom, seeking the wisdom of other leaders and mentors that can help provide advice and pushback and support. And then also having a time of evaluation. So say, for instance, you're called, you feel called to ministry. Asking, inviting those in to observe your specific ministry you feel called to so that they can provide a healthy and realistic evaluation of your call and confirm it or help you to see a different direction. And so I love in the last couple of verses, Paul says this. He is clarifying his involvement with the other apostles and being unknown in the churches in Judea. And he says this in 23 and 24. The only we're hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Point number three is this. The gospel transforms our lifestyle. They knew who Paul used to be. They knew his former life. They knew his former ways. They glorified God because of who Paul was now. Do people see that same distinction in your lifestyle today? BC, did they see the distinction? Oh, this person used to be this way. They met Christ and here they are now. Or is it hard for people to tell that we truly are radically transformed by the gospel? Does our speech, does our attitude, does our behaviors reflect a radical change or is that hard to tell? You see, Paul's life was so radically changed that word was spreading. 
the cheese may was starting to spread. The tea was starting to spill. Word was getting out that this guy who once used to destroy this is now preaching the good news of the gospel. He once was. He met Christ. He now is. They glorified God because of me is what Paul says in that final verse. So some questions for us to consider for application are these. How committed are we to the gospel? Are we just here to say, okay, teach me, teach me. I want to learn and we don't do anything with that. Are we being able to share our testimony and share the good news with others? Are we committed to a cultural Christianity of saying, okay, I just come here every week. This feels good. I give my tithe regularly, but I don't do anything with that the rest of the week. I just come back on Sunday, get refilled, and I don't do anything again. We can't be falling prey to just being a, a cultural Christian. God needs us to be committed to the gospel because people need to see that visible witness of our lives and the power of his saving grace. Does our lifestyle reflect the saving power of God's amazing grace for others to see? Do others glorify God because of the life we live? So many men and women that I've encountered over the years, when I ask them to share their testimony with me, they often say, well, I don't have a Damascus Road experience. You know, I'm not like Paul. And I feel like sometimes we get so caught up in thinking that our, our life, our story isn't as glorious as the person next to us. But I would say, I would say this, we too have a Damascus Road experience. We once were, we met Jesus, we now are. That is radical in itself, ladies. God save wretched sinners like us. You know how I used to be. I know how I used to be. We all know how we used to be. And if, if it wasn't for a but God moment where he inserted himself in our lives at the right time and saved us, we know we would not be where we are today. Romans 5, 8 tells us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. No good works, nothing good in us. We couldn't work to obtain this good life. It was in the lowest state of who we are as sinful beings. Christ said, I got this. I died for you. And I have given you a different path and a new life. You are a new creation. The old has passed away. Your story matters even if you think it's not as glorious as the person sitting next to you. We don't need to give glory to our former life of sin. We need to be focused on giving glory to the one who saved us from that sin because we know Jesus paid it all. So here are some final thoughts that I want to leave with you today. The gospel is our defense. That helps us to combat any false teaching that comes our way, we know it, we preach it, we believe it, we stand on it. That is our defense. His amazing grace, that's our offense. We realize that we were wretched sinners, we don't deserve to live, and we get to share this amazing grace with everybody we come in contact with. And then lastly, the Bible is our playbook. Read it, meditate on it, enjoy it, stand on the truth, stand on business because this is the truth, and this is the way, and it is God's word. I hope that you're encouraged. I hope that you have great discussion. We love you, and we can't wait to see you next week.